Okay, so there's this quote that I love. It's it's from Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Oliver is an American jurist who served in the Supreme Court for some time, uh, and he said this. He said, let me pull it up real quick. He said, a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. And maybe you've never heard of Oliver, or maybe you could care less about who he is or what he did, but if you're like me and share a love for travel and a desire to bring social impact into your world, then you probably resonate somehow with these words. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've, I've, over the course of this podcast and over the course of my life, I've gotten to meet so many incredible people who have lived lives that shape the future and the world around them for good. And it's one of my favorite things about what I do. And, you know, I'm always trying to find common threads between all of these people. And I found a number of common threads and, and I've, I've written about that in like a newspaper. And, you know, we've talked about that on the show before, but one of the biggest common threads is just kind of like a, a almost like a little aside is everybody's love for travel. You know, I think that everybody on this podcast, everybody that I admire to some extent has been shaped by new experiences. And sometimes, you know, that's that's a, a small little travel into the next state over and, you know, having your mind blown in that way. And sometimes it's going across the world. I don't know. I, I think I think that's a really, really cool thing. And so I'm really excited about my guest for this week's episode of the show because the way that she has allowed her own life to be stretched by new experiences in a way that she'll never be able to go back and has created a platform for young students to have that exact same experience at such a formative time in their lives is incredible. So Abby Fallick is the founder and CEO of Global Citizen Year. It's a for-purpose social venture on a mission to make it normal for kids to choose a bridge year abroad after high school. And the hope is basically that kids would get to travel abroad, the kids would be immersed in a culture internationally, and that they would learn from the people that they're surrounded by, and that that would, you know, change the way that they live their lives from there on out. And it would make them better students when they went to college, you know, the next year and make them better human beings. And it would just be a really key experience. And I loved getting to have that conversation with Abby this week. Abby is a recognized expert on social innovation and the changing landscape of education. Uh, She's been featured in Forbes, NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times. You know, she's been featured in a lot of places. Uh, And now she's featured here on Sounds Good. I am Brandon Harvey. This is Sounds Good. This is the podcast where every single week we have hopeful conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. And And I loved so much of this conversation. And so I'm excited to dive into it. So let's just jump straight into this. Okay, so Abby, you are somebody who has started something really cool. And and we'll get into that in a little bit. uh, But you're also somebody whose life revolves largely around this idea of travel. And so I want to start off this conversation by asking, you know, are these things that have been infused in your life for a long time, like since an early age, or are those things that came along later in the process? So I had the incredible fortune um, of being born to parents who were avid travelers. They actually hadn't had opportunities to travel until their 30s, but they then were hooked. And it was in the 70s. So it was 1978, the year before I was born. And they spent a year, they quit their jobs, took all their savings and traveled around the world. And it was at a time when uh, people weren't doing that. And they weren't in very sort of well-worn places. So they were among the first Westerners in China in 1978. They were in the Seychelles. They were in Sri Lanka, um, Indonesia. And one of my favorite parts of this story is that, I mean, not only was there not email, the only way that they were able to communicate, they dictated into, I guess, an eight track. Now I'm old, but I'm not that old. An eight track tape that they then sent via snail mail 
to one set of parents, who sent to the other set of parents, who sent to the siblings. And so there was this three month lag in anybody hearing anything from my parents who were at the far ends of the world. Anyway, I love the story because, you know, they've since transcribed the journal and it's just, it's an amazing time capsule to understand what the world must have felt like at a time when, um, when what they were doing was really so fresh and so untraveled. Um, but they in, then in deciding to have a family looked at each other and made the commitment that the most important investment they were going to make in our education was going to be travel. And they made good on it. That's really cool. And and it's really interesting to think about how, I don't know, outside of you having the opportunity to travel, what do you think that uh, their experience traveling, you know, and, and the impact that had on them, you know, what kind of impact did that have on you and your siblings? I love this quote. I think it's Oliver Wendell Holmes says that a, a mind once expanded by a global experience never contracts to its mm. original dimension. Wow. Oh, that is my new favorite quote. That's incredible. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So, yeah, I, I remember when I first read that and I said, that's that's everything. I mean, in some ways, that's actually my life's work and life's mission and certainly my life's my early life experience. So I have two younger siblings and from a really young age, my parents dragged us around the world with them. We felt like, why aren't we going to more normal places where people go on vacation? But we were in Southern Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Central America, and some of my earliest memories, and I would say my most visceral early learnings, uh, had to do with being so far from anything that felt familiar and being thrown into a foreign context and culture and language and having the opportunity to interact with kids who were about my age and maybe we were playing games or doing art projects or whatever it was that my mom, my, that my parents sort of set up that would allow us to interact. Uh, that just was that flash of realization that the world is huge and wildly unequal and t- totally random where and when I happen to have been born. Um, and while I was meeting kids who might have the same hopes and aspirations for their lives, and certainly the same talents, just because of the circumstances of where they were born, they were un- much less likely to have access and opportunity. Um, and I have a wonderful mentor who talks about a social justice nerve, this idea that once it's exposed, you can never ignore it. And I think for me, it was in those early experiences traveling um, that that everything was shaped about my sense of who I wanted to be, how I wanted to use my access and privilege and education. And in many ways, it's a straight through line from there to what I do today. It's so interesting that you're that you're describing your experience like this. And, and I love that quote about, you know, is this nerve that you can't ignore once it's exposed? Because that's, I think, my experience. I started traveling. I guess I traveled to a, a new country right before because it was right before I went into high school, I visited Trinidad and Tobago. And then shortly thereafter, I started getting to experience a lot of different places. I, I ended up going to India and then the Philippines and then China and Hong Kong and then all over Africa and uh, just started continuing to have these experiences. And it changed the trajectory of my life. And I don't think that everybody who like visits a new country has to go into, you know, humanitarian social good work like you and I have, but it is interesting that both of us had those early experiences uh, and and both of us kind of went in those directions. And it's really special. It's interesting just hearing you, hearing you talk and I'm, I'm sort of seeing an intersection for the first time. So thank you. Where there's this piece about any kind of travel and leaving our comfort zone that shapes a sense of empathy and shapes a global perspective. So the ability to see our worldview or our identity from a different vantage. And that can happen on a trip to Europe. Uh, There's this intersection then with the insights around poverty and development and inequity and the sort of social justice part of that. Um, And I think it depends on where you have traveled and how, but certainly for me, and it sounds like for you as well, it's at that intersection of global immersion and experience um, of really extreme poverty and inequity that kind of lit a fire in me and and set me up to do what I do. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, it's it's so interesting. And I love that that started you down that path. Tell me a little bit about those formative years, especially 
I don't know, for me, it was high school. So for you, you know, what did high school look like for you uh, when you weren't traveling? You know, how were you already seeing your passions and the ways that you saw the world shifting? Yeah. Well, so one thing to say that I realize now I can sort of see in hindsight is this idea. I think Steve Jobs is famous for having said that, the, you know, the dots never connect from where you're standing, but from some future point when you look back, the dots always connect. So I can tell the story in a way where it feels like, ah, one step to the other, it all makes sense. The through line's so clear. But as we know, the path is always circuitous and it's, you know, it's the failure resume, uh, the failures along the way that are as formative, more, most formative. Um, but, but I will say that I can now look back and recognize that even as a young kid, I had this wiring to be entrepreneurial. So it was just always my instinct to scan for what was a possibility, but wasn't yet happening. So I remember, you know, trying to make some money when I was probably six or seven and I gathered my dad's old neckties and sold them door to door in my neighborhood. (laughs) Did you have his consent to be like selling his neckties or were you just grabbing? (laughs) I hope so. He was probably looking out of the corner of his eyes thinking, what have we got on our hands here? That's amazing. Who who is this person? What's she doing? And, you know, then I remember I started babysitting. So we, we didn't, my parents, um, didn't really give us an allowance. It was kind of us to on us to to work to earn money. And so I remember babysitting felt like a, a great way to earn more money than selling ties door to door. Um, and and then I had this idea of what if I could babysit a lot of kids at the same time. So when I was in middle school, I started a summer camp for neighborhood kids. And I remember, you know, I hired my sister and a bunch of my friends and uh, you know, we put these flyers in the mailboxes of all the parents in the community. And anyway, we we ran a summer summer camp, and um, it felt like, oh, this was just my way. Rather than seeing all the ways it might not have worked, I sort of felt like that was my fuel, and that was my roadmap was figuring out how to get something started from scratch. And um, you know, flash forward many years, I find myself sitting. I was. At, Harvard Business School, which is the last place in the world I would have ever imagined myself as somebody who'd been on this sort of social justice, social impact track my whole life. But I I was there on a mission, and the mission was really to launch Global Citizen Year. But I remember really being struck in that context by the definition of entrepreneurship as the, the pursuit of an opportunity independent of the resources that you currently control. And I I remember seeing that displayed and just thought, man, that's exactly what drives me, which is I don't see uh, constraints. I see opportunities. And it's always my inclination to figure out how do we, you know, break through the challenges to gather new resources to make something happen that didn't yet exist. I love that definition of entrepreneurship. And and that gets me fired up, too, because I've, I've got entrepreneurial blood uh, running through my veins. And I think that's really cool that you can kind of see those dots, uh, you know, in hindsight and how you started connecting them. And so you, you alluded to going to Harvard Business School. Uh, but before that, you know, because it, it, it seems like that was maybe out of the blue from what you were expecting, you know, like, where did you think that you were going to, like, where did you think your life was going to be heading? Yeah, well, I didn't know. I literally knew nobody who had been to business school. I didn't even really know what that meant. I didn't know the difference between finance or accounting or marketing. It was all kind of the same to me. So, um, you know, what my when I finished high school, I I was tired. I had been a good student. I had followed the checklist. I'd gotten into a you know, really selective college. That was my first choice. I was going to Stanford. So I was really excited, and yet something felt kind of empty in it. And you know, there's a wonderful book out right now called Excellent Sheep, which I think is such a perfect descriptor for how our schools are training today's kids, which is, you know, following closely in line, excellent at what they're doing, but with no idea the why. It's like that Sir Ken Robinson TED Talk where he dives into yes, the problems exactly. with the American education system. That's exactly it. And I, I mean, I think we all experienced it as products totally. of that system, right? Even... Even if we went to terrific and progressive schools, there's such a disconnect between what's taught and learned in a classroom context and the ex- types of experiences that really bring us to life or help ignite a sense of purpose or help us follow our curiosity in a way that really unveils some kind of passion. I mean, maybe for some people that happens in a lecture hall. I think it's unusual that it does. I think you know most people reflect on their most formative learning experiences not having had anything to do with 
formal education. Um, I, I think Mark Twain says, "Don't let your schooling, schooling get in the way of your education." Your education. Yes. <laughs> Right. So I'm trying to keep up with you with like the quotes. You're like crushing it on the quote game. And I feel like (laughs) I've got a long way to go in acquiring these like guiding quotes in my life. (laughs) Well, I I feel like I'm I'm nothing without the quotes because I, you know, it's there's so many influences that have been so formative. And I, I, I just I love words. I love language. I love wise people who put language to things that I couldn't express on my own. And but I, you know, it, it's a flash forward. My experience was finishing high school, feeling burnt out and uh, hungry for more, knowing that there was, I really wanted to have an impact on the world, but I didn't know how and I didn't know where to start. And I remember calling the Peace Corps on the phone and being told, wait, 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 go to college. We'll see you in four years. You need a college degree. And feeling like, well, hmm, it's kind of ironic. So here I am. Yes, I'm young, but you'd send me to the military, right? We send a million 18 year olds into military service or. If I happened to be Mormon, this would be the time I would do my Mormon mission for two years somewhere in the world, which is such a rite of passage in that tradition and such a leadership experience and sort of formative way of preparing a young person for adulthood. So I I ended up going straight to college, but after two years was just too antsy to stay put. So took off with a backpack, spent the year in Brazil and Nicaragua pretty much on my own, having what I would now say is the equivalent of my global citizen year, but you know, well before its time and without any of the structure or support um, that we've now put in place. And, you know, really ever since I, I, I came back to school and I, I petitioned for my experience to count for course credit and they gave it to me. So I got a full year of credit. What? For, That's brilliant. Yeah, Great call. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's an insight in that too, which was that the the things that we learn outside of the classroom are as credit worthy as anything we're going to, you know, regurgitate onto a test. Um, And so that's actually one of the guiding principles at Global Citizen Year right now as well, which is this is not sort of the side note or the diversion from your education. This is the heart of your education. And this is the foundation or the launch pad from which the rest, the rest will stem. So I petitioned for this year, then suddenly I had only one year of college left. And I felt like Suddenly I had a sense of focus and purpose and I knew why I was there and I had you know, confidence to build relationships with professors and I knew why I was studying what I was studying. And, and I also felt like, wait a sec, if I'd only had this formative maturing experience earlier, I would have approached college from the very beginning with this sense of purpose and what a missed opportunity that I didn't and that all of my peers, you know, anyone who did a study abroad in a junior year missed the opportunity to have that experience inform their higher education. So that's really the the insight here. I feel like we all like mildly regret our freshman year of college. We're like... Yeah, right. Exactly. Somebody's paying a lot of money for that, right? Whether it's a family member or a a college financial aid program. And there got to be better ways to use that transition into adulthood. It does not make sense that we send kids in droves to their freshman dorm to figure out who they are and who they want to (laughs) become. And so Global Citizen Year is ultimately, you know, this thing that you created to be, you know, the answer to that problem, to be the solution to that problem that you had experienced, but also the solution that you'd experienced. Tell me about the process of like bringing this thing to life. You know, it's funny. I recently heard somebody say, well, everybody takes a gap year. It's called freshman year. (laughs) And so much of what we're after is to reinvent the pathway into college, the on-ramp into college to repurpose the way we've traditionally thought about, you know, quote unquote gap years. And I say quotes because it's such a terrible metaphor, right? A gap is a gaping hole and parents are reluctant to send their kids into a hole they might not, might or not, might not emerge from. So we're really, really focused on how do we shift the narrative so that this year is not remedial for kids who didn't get into college. It's not elite just for kids who can pay. It's not kind of frivolous and ad hoc and wandering. That this year, if you do it on purpose, changes everything that comes next. Um, and it starts with the language and the metaphors we use. Again, I, I think, you know, we try not to say the term gap year except for when we're describing what it's not. So you asked about getting Global Citizen Year started. And yeah. It's kind of like, where to begin? So, I mean, the early seeds were planted as a kid. And then in my, you know, rejection from the Peace Corps. And then in the year I spent during college, 
uh, working on my own in, in Latin America and feeling a little bit limited in terms of what I actually learned because I was on my own. I didn't have um, kind of a context to put my learning in. And, you know, I worked um, about five years after college. I led biking and hiking trips around the world for a travel company for a while, which was super, super fun and fabulous experience. Um, and probably the best leadership training I've ever had in some ways. Um, and then I spent five years for a, um, an org- a nonprofit in, in New York City that no longer exists, which also makes sense. Um, but it was the re- that was the reason I ended up going to business school, was watching time after time my work in the social sector, the sort of, I hate the term nonprofit, I wish we could call it the four impact sector to really describe what it is but and not what it's not. But I felt like, you know, there was talent and there were resources and there were meaty, intractable, critical problems to solve. And the impact rarely got traction um, just because it was like the, the good intentions weren't enough and there wasn't a clear approach to strategy or financial management. Obviously, this is not always true, but I do think historically, not-for-profits have sort of gotten a pass. There's this notion of like nonprofit leadership being different from leadership. Totally. Well, and we we had uh, Scott Harrison of Charity Water on the podcast. And, oh, good. And, and, yeah. we, and he's amazing. I've, I've admired him for years. And, and he talked about how you know, the design for all these nonprofits was bad. And he's like, let's have a nonprofit that's a cross between Nike and Apple. You know, nobody's nobody's doing anything like that. Everybody's like, oh, well, you know, we're a nonprofit. So that's why we have bad design. It's like, no, like, let's make this sexy. Let's make this, you know, impactful. And there's something powerful there about, uh, you know, not just settling for the status quo just because you can as a nonprofit. Totally. I had somebody say... Um, that you know, five hundred one c three can be your your tax status, but it doesn't need to be your management style. Mm, which I like I loved. that. I like that. Yeah. A lot. So so that is our tax status at Global Citizen Europe. But <laughs> I I went to business school on purpose to really learn how to build and scale an enterprise, regardless of our tax status. Um, and for me, it was absolutely the best place to be incubating a big idea. And so while you were at business school, did you have this in mind? Because it's so funny, you know. I went to business school, but but not Harvard. Uh, and the whole time I was there, I had exactly like what I wanted to create and build in mind. And it was so fun because I would take you know lectures that I was hearing, and I would go straight back and I would apply that to my business. Like I would, you know, I'd, I'd open up a spreadsheet and like directly make that thing happen. And then you know, I was I was running a a business doing marketing and social media. And then uh, fast forward a few years later and, you know, I've got a podcast and I created a newspaper and all of a sudden all these things that I had had learned and applied like were so different from what I was experiencing. And so I, I almost feel like I have to relearn everything that I learned years ago because I was applying it to the wrong stuff. But it sounds to me like you went into business school with a vision. You're like, I'm going to create something and you were able to apply it and then you actually were able to Build that. Is, it, is that true? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I couldn't have articulated it perfectly, but I knew conceptually where it was going and I knew I was there to start something. Um, and exactly as you described, being in school on a mission with a set of questions I was trying to answer and with, you know, a business plan I was trying to develop, I read my case studies selectively for the exhibits that I could cut and paste into what I was working on and chose my classes based on what I thought would be most relevant to my own planning, um, you know, found the confidence to talk to the case protagonists when I felt like they were people who could be advisors or donors or supporters in some way. So it was just such a rich place to be uh, and to be entrepreneurial. Um, And I feel super, super indebted to um, just everybody who was there to be helpful in the years before I was able to even articulate where I was heading, but it's it's where it all came together for sure. What was the first year of getting Global Citizen Year off the ground like for you? Oh my, hard. Um, I mean, I think there are sort of startup stories and mm, trials and tribulations that are shared for anybody who started something from scratch. And, and particularly, you know, if you've got a big aspiration and um, and the reality ends up 
being more cumbersome. It takes longer. Uh, you sometimes have to go slow to go fast is what I've learned the hard way over and over again. But I remember it was um, the fall of 2008 when I was initially sort of running around with the plan and trying to raise new nonprofit money, which, um, man, was not good timing. So the, you know, markets crashed and everybody was scared. And I just felt like this might be over before we even started. Um, and then things started to turn. And it's, you know, with anything in, in raising money, nobody wants to be first. But if you get the right first mover, then a lot of people line up and want to be next. Um, so I just remember, you know, there must have been at least 100 no's before I got to a yes. And I actually started taking pride in those no's and gathering those no's and using those no's as my fuel and recognizing that a no meant at least I had the courage to ask, which took me a while to even get there. Um, but that was that was very helpful because at some point the no's started becoming yeses. Um we started raising some money, hiring initial teammates, and we were off. That's incredible. And so what did Global Citizen Year look like that first year then? You know, like, just give some context on, on, on what you had created. And then, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing how what you created then is different from what you've, you know, what you're putting out into the world now and how that's evolved and shifted. Yeah. So it's fun to think back on. So we were squatting in somebody else's office space downtown San Francisco because we couldn't afford our own. Um, I had, let's see, the first person I hired, I, I was working with this leadership coach who was so awesome. One of the first things he had me do was spend a week tracking my energy. So I was supposed to list out all the things I did in a given day. And I was doing literally everything at that point and map the things that gave me energy and the things that depleted me. And he said, your job is over time to move more and more toward the things that energize you and to hire people who are energized by the things that deplete you, which I just thought was so clever and so, so evident. But um, he really helped accelerate my process of recognizing the role that I was most excited to play. And so my first hire was somebody who was really into the sort of nitty gritty of the operations and the building the website and figuring out the email list serve and filing our 501c3. And um, so that, that was where we started. And then, you know, flash forward, we hired somebody to run the program. And it was really just the three of us in the first year when we launched. We had 11 intrepid fellows, fellows we call them, who are the, the high school grads who are selected to join Global Citizen Year. And I look back and I have to say, I cannot even imagine how we got Anybody to sign that <laughs> first year? So I remember I did all the interviews. I was interviewing all the parents by Skype. And I remember sort of starting to see this common theme, which was the parents who were willing to send their kids to this totally unproven, crazy big new thing, all had in common that they were entrepreneurial or self-employed or pioneers somehow themselves. So I remember them all saying to me, we think it is so cool that our kids get to be in the first year of something, which was so neat because I it made me yeah. feel like I want to be like that someday. I mean, that quite it was an optimistic way to look at it, which is totally amazing and really unusual, but I think amazing. And now they can look back and say, "Oh, my, you know, my kids were in the very first cohort." But yes, yeah, so we got we got started with a really small group. I did you know most of the programming and the training. We had programs in just two countries, and after about three weeks, once our fellows landed in the countries. Um, one of the country leads quit with, I don't know, maybe one week's notice. So I'm sitting in San Francisco and we've got five of our 11 fellows in Guatemala suddenly with no staff member. Um, so I hopped on a plane with my then friend, soon to be boyfriend, now husband. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And we stepped in and took over. So that's you know, we, leadership right we, there. We, we led the program for a bit, found a new country director. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think that these early stories are so important in building empathy and understanding. I mean, part of what was very humbling about that experience was seeing firsthand exactly why our country lead had quit. And it was because what I was asking him to do from an office in San Francisco was completely unreasonable. And I never would have known that if I hadn't actually gotten on the plane to walk in his shoes. So that was a huge, huge learning and just continues to stay with me, which is when I'm asking people to do something and there's sort of a disconnect, 
I need to back up and actually sit in someone else's seat to understand from their perspective um, what it looks and feels like. That's a really cool little takeaway right there. I think that's that's fascinating and, and a good reminder for myself as well. Okay, so give me a little bit of a breakdown on Global Citizen Year then, like in its in its current form. You've got students who are taking a bridge year, not a gap year, a bridge year between high school and college to better prepare them. Uh, you ship them off to some other countries, and, and that's, you know, quite the experience, I would imagine. You know, what all is going into their year abroad and their year of, of experience? So each year we scour the country um, looking for kids coming out of high schools across the country. We've had kids from 45 states and really, really broad range of backgrounds by design. So each year we're building a cohort that reflects our country's diversity. And I think that's what I know that's one of the things that really sets this opportunity apart from most travel programs, which tend to skew, you know, upper, upper middle class, wealthier kids, typically white, um, you know, more often coastal. And, and we're really by design trying to seed a new generation of leaders who, again, better reflect the, the breadth of experiences in this country. And why is that? Why, why that intentionality? Because I think that's incredible, but I know that that doesn't happen on accident. Well, it comes back to that, the, the first thing we talked about in terms of the social justice nerve. So for me, this is not worth doing if it is just another stepping stone exclusively for affluent kids. I think that, um, you know, we've designed something that you can't do on your own. So even a family who could pay for it or set up an internship for their kids somewhere far flung in the world, what we offer in terms of the train, the world-class training structure and support, this lifelong network, the preparation for college, those are things that you can't find somewhere else and you can't pay for. However, the importance of leveling the playing field of access to these opportunities and making sure that kids who have the potential but who would never have the opportunity to fulfill it is just, it's in my bones. That's that's who we are and how we think about what we do. So each year we're targeting that a third of our kids are on a full scholarship, a third are paying a partial tuition, and then a third are full pay. And it's it's pretty hard to find that you know, 50% of our kids this year are, are kids of color uh, who self-identify that way. And it's just, it's it's so much more realistic as a microcosm of who we are and who we are becoming as a country um, than, than most of the sort of elite types of experiences that draw a really predictable set of kids. And so that's how it starts off. You start off with, you know, a selection process that that brings in like a great, awesome squad of kids. What do they do next? I love the term squad. All right. Copying. <laughs> that's awesome. And people, um, it like may not be cool to say anymore. And and certainly when people listen to this again in like a year, it, it will be 0% cool, but it feels fun to well, say. I'll test it. We'll, we'll market test it, but I, I guess it's the same <laughs> squad. It's better than cohort, which is what we often say. So team crew, <laughs> I don't know. I like squad. So we've got our squad each year. And just to give you a sense, we grew from 11 that first year to we had 100 last year and 150 who've joined us this, this year. Um, and we're actually just gearing up right now for our next growth spurt. So um, hopeful that Five years from now, we'll be at 1,000 kids a year, and 10,010 is the vision. So it's feeling it's feeling good, and it's really exciting to feel the momentum build, and our applications are doubling each year, and there's just a sense that this is becoming part of the new normal. Um, so, I, yeah, I can walk you through a little bit how our how our program works. Yeah, I'd love that. Just a breakdown of, you know, what these kids are experiencing. So after we select them, they come together for a boot camp. It's a leadership training that we host in the Silicon Valley, and we're introducing them to thought leaders and entrepreneurs and business people and um, academics. And and it's all really to just sort of inspire their sense of what's possible uh, and to connect them with each other and to help them develop a set of skills as well, particularly around self-reflection. So we have a a whole course on mindfulness that's integrated start to finish throughout the year. And this year is as much about exploring the inner landscape as it is the outer. Um, another one of my favorite travel writers, Pico Ayer, you may know, 
he talks, he says, we don't travel to move, we travel to be moved. Um, and so it's really about, you know, how do we turn the, the spotlight inward to really focus on the inner experience of leaving your comfort zone and uh, developing a new identity and a new context. So anyway, after that boot camp, they travel in teams to their country posts. And right now we've got programming and we have teams on the ground in Brazil and Ecuador, Senegal and India, where they stay for a full school year. It's a deep global immersion. They live with a family. They do meaningful work with a local organization. And there's structure and support from our local team. So they have a team leader who's there to coach and encourage them, a team of other fellows who don't live in the same community typically, but they're close by in the same region. They come together for training seminars. They share their experiences through blogs and social media. Um, and, you know, they come back and we help them transition into college. And, and what we're seeing is that this is often the best preparation for higher education that a kid could ever have. And when they're in these other countries, their emphasis is not on necessarily service or, or teaching. Really, they're showing up in these other countries to, to learn and learn from, you know, the people in these communities and learn in this context. Is that right? It's exactly right. And it's a great distinction. Um, so we're working with 18 year olds from the U S many of whom have never traveled before. Most don't speak the language that they're showing up in uh, or the, the, the community where they show up. It's a foreign language to them. And so we've got to be really thoughtful about what is an appropriate role for a young foreigner in that context. And, you know, I'm a, a, a big believer that so much of our focus on service and volunteerism has been quite misguided Um, and you know, the stories of the mission trip to Mexico, where you find out after you're building a house and you find out after the fact that, you know, the high school kids, while they're sleeping at night had whatever, you know, bricks they had laid were, you know, the work was redone by the local community while the kids were sleeping essentially. Right. Because what business did they have building a house? Not only, you know, should it have been left to a local community, but they were not doing it well, which is sort of derogatory and embarrassing (laughs) to their hosts. So we have really deliberately chosen to focus that we call the play the work placement. We call it an apprenticeship where the emphasis is on your learning. You are watching, you're being mentored, you're understanding what it's like to be an assistant teacher in an overcrowded classroom in Pune, India, or you are, you know, an extra set of hands you know, supporting the lead physician in a maternity clinic in rural Senegal, you know, or you're working on an agriculture project and you're learning about sustainable farming in Brazil. So it just gives you a sense. But um, it'd be so easy to show up and just want to feel like the white savior that's coming to help people. But you're like an 18 year old kid who doesn't have experience. And, And I mean, even as somebody who's not an 18 year old with some experience, like I don't have a whole lot to give, I, but I have a lot to learn. And so I like that a lot. I mean, we, I think it's human nature. that We want to be helpful. We just, we want to be helpful. We want to have a meaningful impact wherever we go, whatever we do. And it's, um, you know, I think a lot of our fellows come to us with that intent. And then on arrival, I, it, part of the magic of what we do is the length of the experience. Because if you're going to stay somewhere, from September through April, you are going deeper, staying longer. You're learning to speak to people in their own language. You are literally walking in their shoes. And you pretty quickly learn that the assumptions you came in with are bogus. And, you know, by the end of your experience, you're probably just beginning to know how much you don't yet know. Um, So there's this transformation that happens even if you come in with a, you know, a bit of a savior mentality, by the time you leave, you can't help but be super, super humbled. It's interesting because you could go in, you know, and in the first few weeks be like, oh, I like, I just want to feel good. Like I want to give back because it feels good. Uh, but when you stay longer, you you realize that there's something deeper than that. And and it reminds you of this, this thing that I know that you talk about a lot that that I love so much is this idea of real good versus feel good. And uh, I would love for you to just, you know, break down what that means to you. It's really core to our learning model is, and, and one of the outcomes we care most about is that all of our fellows, as they become alumni, 
can distinguish between the feel good and the real good. And, and what we mean by that is if you look around, the number of new nonprofits being started on college campuses is totally absurd. I mean, most of them don't have any business being new standalone organizations, but we have glorified the entrepreneur and the social entrepreneur even more so where you've got kids in a classroom so far from the context of the problem they're trying to address, coming up with some technical solution. It reminds me of uh, of a friend of mine who says his generation, it was cool to start bands and uh, and my generation is cool to start nonprofits. And I think that that's maybe true. Oh, totally. But I actually think that's a disaster. Oh, 100%. And, you know, very, very, very few of those organizations will ever get enough traction to really impact the problem they're trying to solve. I have a friend who's, who's been talking, in fact, um, David Bornstein wrote Social Entrepreneurs and How to Change the World. But he's, he's kind of shifted from a focus on where will the next social entrepreneurs be and who are the problem solvers to think about how do you train young people to figure out what works and to take it where it's needed? as opposed to being focused on starting something new from scratch. How do we build solution accelerators rather than problem solvers in a new generation? And if you've got this sort of solution accelerant mentality, you're much more likely to go with full humility and ask, who else is already doing this? What's worked? What doesn't? What role should I play in somebody else's context? You know, what can I learn from a community that's been trying to do this for generations. Um, And then you question what some of the motivations might be sitting in your engineering class and, you know, on college campus to develop a, I don't know, electric baby incubator or whatever it is for a context where that actually would make no sense. Um, So that's, that's what we mean, the real good and feel good. We're really hoping to breed a generation of solution accelerants, Young people who are optimistic about the future, but who know how to figure out what is the problem I'm actually trying to solve? How would I know if I solved it? And what is the most effective way to get from here there? That's beautiful. I I really do love that concept a lot. And I love the way that you've created this, you know, this organization, this for purpose, not nonprofit, for purpose organization that not only like lives this out, but also, you know, passes this on it, it you know it passes it on to this next generation of people who can be the difference makers in the world and can be difference makers uh in in the best possible way and i think this is maybe a good spot to wrap up and i i just want to ask you you know for people who in their daily life are they want to experience the world and they and they want to make a difference in the world but also you know, they don't want to get stuck in this little feel good world. They want to actually create real good. You know, what kind of action step would you give them to uh, to actually be a part of that and, and, and to do meaningful, long term, important work? I mean, it has to start with getting proximate to the thing and making sure you're really uncomfortable. So we don't learn when we're comfort- in our comfort zone. We don't learn when we're in our panic zone. We learn when we're in that stretch. And you've got to stay long enough. Um, and, and to be honest, a school year is hardly even scratching the, surf- the, the surface in you know, a, a community that you've never visited before. But it's a start. And it gives you a sense of how many layers. We talk about layers of the onion. The longer you stay, the more you realize you don't yet know the more nuanced your understanding is. And, and I'm totally convinced that that's the only way that that real social progress comes is uh, through empathy, through human-to-human ties, through a, a cross-sector way of thinking as well. I think we've too long put um, kind of the onus on the quote-unquote not-for-profit sector to solve the social problems of the world and You know, if we look at all the gajillion dollars that have been poured into all kinds of efforts that are not actually scaling to the size of the problems they're trying to solve, we just have to back up and rethink. So I guess I would say, you know, systems entrepreneurship is part of what's needed. And it's thinking about what's the role of the private sector, the public sector, and the social sector in working together to address climate change, poverty, and migration, um, extremism, whatever the cause might be. So we need to be less siloed 
but get ourselves close enough so that we're actually directly impacted by the thing we're trying to work on. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. I'm pretty sure that immediately after I finish recording this, I'm going to go and I'm going to write, we don't travel to move, we travel to be moved on my bathroom mirror or in my passport. I don't think that's legal. Uh, Something like that, because that's so key. I want to always remember that truth and always move towards this idea that, that there's a piece about travel and about leaving our comfort zones that shapes our sense of empathy and our global perspective. Such good stuff. Oh my goodness. Abby's incredible. And I'm so excited that so many people got to learn from her by listening to this episode. She's working toward real messy hope that is totally exposing that quote unquote social justice nerve that just can't be ignored. For all the entrepreneurs listening to the podcast that want to create real good in the world instead of just feel good, take Abby's advice and number one, Follow your curiosity and see how it unveils your passion. Number two, seek to expose that social justice nerve that you can't ignore. And number three, ask yourself this question. How do I gather the resources for a possibility of something that currently does not exist? And who knows where these questions might take you. You can get to know Abby's organization, Global Citizen Year, even better by following them on Twitter and Facebook. And you can totally check out their website. It's globalcitizenyear.org. And if you're new to this show, but you liked this episode, you really connected with Abby, and maybe you're interested in innovative for-purpose social ventures, you know, check out our conversations with Scott Harrison, who founded Charity Water, and Jason Russell, who founded Invisible Children. I loved those conversations. Sounds Good is available on Apple Podcasts. And if that's what you use, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and even leave us a review if you've got a few seconds. It's super easy and really helps people find the show. We're also on Spotify now. This is super exciting. We're super jazzed about it. It's a great way to share the show with your friends. And so go check that out. It's pretty fun. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good, 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 a community that believes in the power of of celebrating good news and becoming good news. And as always, a huge shout out to Chad Michael Snavely and his team at CM Studio for editing and mixing the show. And a huge thank you to Christy Karenbrock for all of her production help. You can get lots more hopeful stories that we share on social media by following us everywhere at at Good 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 Co. We've got some cool stuff out there that we'd love for you to see. We also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper It's a real-life newspaper. It's ridiculous, but it's so fun, so powerful. It celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. I'm really proud of it. The whole team is really proud of it. You can order issue two of the Good Newspaper today. You can check it out, and you can see what else we do at goodgoodgood.co. That's goodgoodgood.co. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week. And we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. And hey, one more thing really quick before we go. Maybe tell someone in your life why they've inspired some good in you. There's no time like the present. Sound good? Sound good?